Hello, Enzo. How are you doing? Hey, John. Great. Thanks for having me today, Chris. Good day. Hey, hey Enzo. It's great to have you. Thanks for coming. Can you, first of all, introduce yourself to our guests? Sure. As you can see behind me, it's Enzo Garitano from IHSA, which is Infrastructure Health and Safety Association uh, here in Ontario. Beautiful. And we're talking about a Sudbury case. Johnny, you want to take that one away? Well, it's kind of interesting here. So it's, it's, it's related to uh, a subcontract uh, group that came on site. Um, I, I, and I'm going to let Enzo get into the details yeah. of it. But, but what the ultimate aspect was is Sudbury was actually deemed as an employer in this situation when, well, kind of they weren't. Didn't they hire out this work to be done by somebody? But now due to an incident, a workplace incident, the verdict showed that, no, they weren't the subcontractor. They were actually an employer in this situation. So give us the, the full rundown, Enzo. Sure. So the city of Sudbury, like uh, any other owner of, of work, you know, they own their city streets and all that stuff. So they were contracting out a road activity, like road reconstruction, sewer water main, whatever the case is. And so they, they hire out, they put out a tender, they get a bunch of prices in and other criteria and they presented the contract to, to a, a constructor or a company that was a general contractor. Unfortunately, on one, uh, in one occasion, the contractor was doing work on the road. Their big, heavy piece of equipment was backing up and they struck and killed a pedestrian that was walking nice. through the construction zone. Long story short, uh, both the constructor or the contractor, general contractor were charged and the city of Sudbury was charged as an employer. And typically an owner, when they contract out work and they kind of hands off, um, because they're, you know, hiring out to a specialized kind of contractor to do the work, typically under the owner and under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, they have very few responsibilities per se. In this case here, due to different circumstances that, uh, from what we understand, occur in the project, the owner, city of Sudbury, delved into different activities um, that were pertinent to the project. Now, quality assurance, go in there, check if they're right, putting the right concrete down or the right amount of stone. Those things are typically, it still insulate the owner from being an employer, per se, under the Green Book or under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which I have a copy here, nice and mm. thick, right? Uh, the act more. The act and regulations for construction, uh, these things are, are built on, unfortunately, incidents and accidents and blood uh, right. over the years. But in the end, um, the city of Sudbury was charged and it was, uh, as an employer because of the, the activities that was, it was undertaking in conjunction with the, the constructor that it had hired. So now the question is, who's responsible for health and safety on the site? The constructor under the Green Book, the Oc Occupational Health and Safety Act, so is the one that is, is contracted to undertake the full responsibility of health and safety and all the activities of that project. Mm -hmm. The owner hands off, but the owner, if they start to delve into how things are done on the project or starts to tell people what to do, or starts to hire different contractors and things could be deemed the constructor and employer of all. So in this case here, it went to, um, different appeals courts in Ontario. And from there, it went to the Supreme court. And the Supreme Court looked at it and they had nine uh, justices look at it. And in the end, one had to pull out. So there was a split decision there, which meant it upheld the decision of the Ontario courts regarding city of Sudbury being deemed an employer for the purposes of the Green Book. Right. Big, big case. Um, now, there's a lot of detail there that'll still come out in the future. So right now, um, What's going to happen is now the Ontario courts will probably start to look at, all right, as an employer, city of Sudbury, what did you do to deem yourself, um, diligent in hiring your contractor or in doing what you did on those sites, which, you know, is, is the, could have, could be they're out as far as being right. responsible because they can say, look, we did all we could in hiring the contractor, or we did all we could with regards to keeping our hands out of the day-to-day -day operations. And that's where the risky part comes in. And the ministry has been, Ministry of Labor, uh, Training and Skills Development has been saying this for years, and they actually have a constructor guideline that comes out and I can give you guys the link to that, but it, it outlines, you know, what you do and don't do as an owner to not get yourself into trouble, um, okay. 
with regards to crossing the line or in transportation lingo, stay in your lane as an owner. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd well, like to bring it back to kind of that, that side, because it's important that owners and, and constructors try to stay in their lane so they don't crisscross sure. and now get things muddy. So right. bottom line, it's going to come back to Ontario courts. We're going to find out a little bit more, but as far as how it applies here, that's, I think what we want to talk about today is how, how does yeah. this apply to, to the transportation sector? Yeah, so, very much so. Cause, cause you know, Hey, that's part of our name trucking risk. Right. So, and it's, it's an interesting because, um, we're, we're all three of us are part of the fleet safety council. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you know, this was brought up at a, at a recent meeting, uh, in central. And it was really because everybody started asking the question, well, hang on, if I'm in transportation, how would this apply to me? So, so let's, let's play out a couple of potential scenarios. So sure. Let, let's say, uh, I've got a, you know, I'm a trucking operation. I've got a warehouse, uh, maybe a cross dock facility. And I hire out some renovation work, uh, either to the office or to the warehouse, to a subcontractor. Right. Um, and I guess maybe I start uh, getting involved to tell the contract, well, no, no, we want to do it this way, or I want to do it that, or, you know, maybe even I have one of my drivers come over and give you a hand to move some material around or something, Absolutely. because, you know, you're, you're, you don't have enough manpower or something. So is there... Right. How could this situation play in here if somebody's injured or hurt? Right. So that's, a, that's an excellent example. Excellent example, because again, as an owner of the facility, your, your main work isn't construction or renovation, right? It's, it's transportation, it's transport of goods and whatever else you do in that, in that respect. So as an owner, you say, yeah, I want to, I want to do a, a renovation to a, a certain part of the building or maybe an add on. So you look at your scope of work. Hopefully you've got some documents that. Again, due diligence, meaning that you can demonstrate what you've done. If someone ever asked the question, you've, you've said to, uh, to the construction world, Hey, I've got this renovation project. Here's the scope of the work, what I want done. And you hire a contractor to do it. If you hire one contractor and that contractor is the only one who you hire and they go ahead and it's kind of like you split your activity. You don't inter, you don't have them interacting with your staff and your operations. Maybe it's something that's cordoned off. That constructor goes ahead and does the work, finishes the renovation. You as an owner have very little in there. All you do is sign the check at the end of it. And you say, look, I hired you. Here's the rationale behind hiring. Cause I put it up to tender in the best of worlds. You ask for what their health and safety management systems look like. So you can again say, yeah, I hired a contractor who can manage health and safety. They have a good reputation around that. They have an active health and safety, um, uh, program and they now recognize if, if any of those lines get crossed, if your staff come into that cordoned off zone, they can say, Whoa, wait a minute. You're not supposed to be in here. Please exit. They maintain the entrance and exit points, all that kind of stuff. It's all great. But when you start to, again, start to tell them what to do, or, Hey, I want to bring in my own electrician to work with your, you know, your drywallers and steel erectors and floor finishers. Now who's in charge? You got to ask yourself the question as an owner. All right. Now they're interacting. If they're interacting, or like you said, your, your own worker to go in there and help who's in charge of that worker. Is it you as the owner of the facility or is it the contractor you brought in? Contractor might say, I have, I have nothing to say about what that person does, uh, or how they do it. And they're interrupting or interacting with my staff. The question is going to be, well, I guess John, maybe you're the constructor as the owner of the facility and the ministry of labor immigration training skills development has often been called in to, especially when stuff happens, comes in and investigates. And, and often if there is that interaction by the owner, we'll deem them the constructor. And guess what happens when that happens? Full thickness of this book applies to you. Right? Mm, ow. Ow. Ouch. Well, yeah. Um, and, and, and sadly, you know, if I've allowed one of my employees or workers to help out in that construction and they've not been properly trained. I'm, I'm putting them at a huge disadvantage and putting them at risk of, of injury. You are, it's, it's high risk work at oftentimes, sometimes working at heights, sometimes working, um, in and around, uh, different, uh, energy sources, whether it's yep. electrical, whether it's water, steam, whatever the case is that you do in your facility. So absolutely it's, there's a ho huge host of, of responsibilities that now kick in as, as the right. employer and or constructor. So. Right. You know, there's other, there's other, you know, we chat a little bit offline, but certainly there's other cases, um, 
when you may become an employer, not necessarily a constructor, because constructor again, deals with projects and renovations and sure. things that, you know, repair. But if you're doing your regular maintenance, um, and we were just talking about another case where a company was fined when they brought in a maintenance worker, you know, you got a rooftop unit or you've got, uh, maybe something has to do with your refrigeration system, you bring in a contractor, go, please go fix my unit. My, my freezer's down and I need, you know, I need it fixed. Well, as an, as the owner of the facility, you have to allow them to understand how to shut things off to make sure that they, when they do the work, they can do it safely, whether it's electrical, whether it's, you know, fans are running or, or condensers are running, whatever the case is that you don't want them to be hurt, but you need to give them access to that thing. And if that access can't happen, um, you may be deemed their employer, uh, because they, if they get hurt and they look at it and they say, well, you, you didn't show them where to turn the thing off, or you didn't allow them to go turn it off. Right. And they got hurt. Well, why didn't you? That's the work that they have to do. Now you're kind of, again, involved in the work. Right. So that company was fined $170,000 okay. when the worker was injured. Yeah. yeah. Enzo, what happens in trucking from time to time? This doesn't happen frequently, but I, back in my driving days, I know I did this where I pulled up to a facility, a loading dock. They're all pretty busy. And they say, hey, it's those two skids right there. Why don't you just throw them on the truck yourself? And so I hop onto the tow motor and, uh, of course, put them on the truck. Right. Is there a liability to the shipper in this case, in that situation? Well, let's, let's, let's look at it from a legal standpoint. So someone comes into your facility and, um, you as the facility says, mm, yeah, we're busy. Um, maybe you can use that forklift and load up your own truck. What have you just allowed them to do? You just allowed them a, to use your equipment and to essentially do work that your employees do. And this isn't a union, non-union or collective bargaining thing. It's about saying, wow, I just let some stranger, if you want to call them, mm -hmm. use a piece of equipment. And does that person, has that person been trained on the equipment? Is that equipment been inspected? Do you know that if they load the truck, they chop their tires, is the truck going to move? Is the fork going to fall off? Is the person going to get hurt? You've just allowed all that to happen as an, as the facility or as the shipper. So you, I would, I would suggest, I'm not the ministry, but I'm just going to suggest the ministry would look at that and say, yeah, Chris, you're the employer now of that, that driver who came into your facility and you allow them to use the equipment. Um, so that's again, a big risk and the requirements of the act again, and the industrial regulations would probably fall directly on you, uh, just as it would any other, your employee who might get hurt in that same circumstance. So instead of being, you know, that, that line of em employer shipper and the driver you waits in a nice safe waiting area, gets loaded and then gets back in their vehicle and goes, you've now become their employer. Congratulations, Chris. And sorry, we didn't talk about this uh, for our guests. We're, obviously, we, we have a little conversation before we hit the record, but, but Enzo just reminded me of something, and I'll throw it out. I'll ask Enzo, and maybe we'll have to cut this out. Uh, driver Inc. So we have a driver that is a contractor or owner-operator. Right. Do both, um, because... This happens frequently in our world. We are certainly giving them direction, driver Inc. and owner operators to do things in a certain way. We, most companies have policy manuals and all that kind of stuff. Um, what happens if they get hurt? That's a tricky one because it depends on what the situation is. Does, does the independent operator truly independent, meaning they don't just work for you. They work for a number of companies. They'll go from place to place. It gets a little bit, it gets dicey as far as who the employer really is. If you continue to, if that person works for you all the time, essentially, uh, the WSIB or workplace safety and insurance board from a, from a risk perspective might look at that and say, geez, are they really independent? Do you control their work? Do you control, do you, A, do they get all the work from you only? Do you control their work? Do you control their time, their equipment, or what they do, schedule? Um, and you may be deemed the employer, regardless of what you think. Um, 
from a from a risk perspective on on WSIB or Workplace Safety Insurance Board coverage. Uh, so if they do get hurt, that could come back to you as as the employer, and you become the employer um, of that person. So again, it's you know the whole independent piece is very tricky, and it it takes investigating to figure it out properly. Uh, but again, if they're with you all the time, uh, you may as well deem them your employee because that's that's what's going to happen. So. So I want to throw a curveball in here because I know our listeners, I know, I know some of them are going to be out there going, thinking exactly what I'm thinking right now. Yeah. And they're going to be going, Enzo, this is all fine. Because what it sounds like you're talking about is provincially regulated companies. I'm a trucking company that's federally regulated. Right. So eh, it doesn't matter. I don't have to listen to those provincial guys. They don't tell me what to do. I'm on a federal basis. Right. So maybe on the driving side when it comes to the driving and what you do across the country and all that, and the rules and regulations, when it comes to, let's say the examples we used earlier about the facilities and having someone come into your facility, if the facility is in Ontario and you're doing regular maintenance type of work or construction work in Ontario, yeah, that your federal piece is out the door, uh, pretty much. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, it's going to be a, if worst case scenario, which regulation is more stringent, Ontario or federal or B. Look, if the jurisdiction is in Ontario, the work is not federally regulated because it's a construction company or a maintenance company coming in to do your air conditioning unit or a renovation to your facility. Um, the fact that you're a federal, federally regulated company for your operations is separate from the work that's going on, mm -hmm. let's say in that renovation or in that, right. that interaction. So right. uh, typically the, if you're in Ontario, typically if you're in Ontario and that work is happening and it's typical project related work, the, the Ontario regulations are going to, and, and the act itself will apply. Cool. And, Interesting. And let's throw a disclaimer out there that, uh, everything Enzo was saying, um, you know, he works at the IHSA, but Enzo, are you a lawyer? No, no, oh, yeah. so, okay. this is, so, no, this is, to, <laughs> so thank you for that disclaimer, because, uh, <laughs> I definitely want to put that out there. This is, this is, uh, again. A lot of, um, a lot of I documents fight. are out there to support the yep. constructor piece, yep. the ministry yep. of labor, you go to Ontario.ca and you look under constructor guideline and that'll give you some really good information as an owner. Uh, it's a very simple search. Uh, there's a lot of case work out there. Uh, the lawyers will get into the nitty gritty and that's why I'm saying you may or may not, I like to use the word yep. may because yep. when things do hit the fan, uh, the ministry and WSIB or ESDC will certainly make their determination. But I think the key part here is try to stay in your lane again, in regards to your responsibilities as an, as an owner and as an employer of your own people. And the minute you start to cross over into directing other people or giving them access to your equipment or delving into their operations, you start to become, you could become their employer directly for the purposes of of, uh, of, of enforcement under the Occupational Safety Act or Green Book. Yeah, it seemed in this Sudbury case, when I read the a small bit that I did read on it, because the city was sending an inspector out, um, that seemed to have a certain amount of weight with the court. If, uh -huh. And it, again, I didn't, yeah. damn, that was like a hundred page uh, <laughs> yeah. ruling. So I didn't read the whole thing. Yeah, yeah so... We found subsequent to the, that ruling, um, you know, we, we work with the Ministry of Labor in our meetings um, at our construction health and safety, uh, sorry, our, our provincial uh, health and labor management health and safety committee for construction and for utilities. Uh, the ministry comes in and they, they've been talking about this topic as well. So there's a little more information there with regards to the city Sudbury. I, you know, I don't want to get into the, the details, but what we were told was there, they also delved into other activities that were pertinent to the work. Um, right. and the direction of the work, you know, if, if, from what I understand, they may have hired the, the paid duty police to do some traffic direction. Well, soon as you, again, now you as an owner started to bring in a different party that interacts with the constructor who should have been doing and directing all that work. Now you start to, you know, blur the lines as to yeah. who the constructor is. So there was, from our understanding through the ministry's report, there were other things that were happening that weren't published per se, or weren't maybe more, more public in the, in the Supreme Court of Canada decision. Well, and from a trucking point of view and stepping away from IHSA a little bit, I just wonder about, um, sub brokering a load. 
uh, for example. And I actually, if I'm the person with the load and I tell the carrier, I want you to take this route. Now, you know, how much control, that's exerting a lot of control. And it you is. Know, we, we won't go down that rabbit hole, but I'm just, I throw that out there because what I'm hearing from you is the more control you put on a subcontractor, the more likely it becomes that you might be deemed their employer. Correct. So you got to be careful. Correct. And you got to ask the question, why would I want to dictate the route if I've hired this company out to do this work for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can tell my own drivers which route I want them to take yep. because yep. there might be some rationale, maybe a, another stop on the way or whatever the case is. But boy, once you start telling an independent, uh, are they really independent? That's the right. question you got to ask yourself. Yeah. 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 So, have, cool. Have we beat this Sudbury thing to death? Right. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I, I'm thinking we have, and, and, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of folks out there that are wondering, okay, this all sounds great. You know, you talk about ministry, this ministry, this and enforcement, that, but who the heck are these IHSAA people that, that seem to know all about all this stuff. So why don't we do a little background on, on sure. IHSAA Enzo and kind, sure. of, kind of shine a light on why you know so much about this. Well, it's, uh, I, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act itself, we are one of six designated safe workplace associations. Um, so we're actually funded through the Worker Sa uh, Workplace Safety and Insurance Board through to the Ministry of Labor to us. <laughs> so a majority, a, a good portion of our funding comes from there. Uh, and we've been around for, believe it or not, 108 years. Oh, uh, in one form or another. That's so, older than John. Yeah, 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 I was going to say, like, we're, you know, it's close, but, you know, but still. <laughs> it is. 108 so, years. That's a hell of a 108 time. years. So in, in, in 1915, um, so we came together, IHSA, Infrastructure Health and Safety Association, came together through an amalgamation in 2010. That amalgamation came from the Electrical Utilities Safety Association, the Construction Safety Association of Ontario, and the Transportation Health and Safety Association of Ontario. So those three legacy associations, came to, uh, came to be back in 1915 for the electrical utilities. There was a, believe it or not, a 50% fatality rate as Ontario was, as Ontario was powering up more significant than, than even the risk associated with going to war at the time. Yeah. So they decided to put together the workers' compensation board back then. And the industry said, let's put some group together to, to start looking at prevention education and how to, how to do things right in the electrical utilities sector so we can stop this from happening. That happened in 1915, a similar conversation and the development of the Construction Safety Association in 1929 and the Transportation Health and Safety Association uh, in 1942. So a lot of history um, and we're proud to support the Fleet Safety Council. So and that came together and correct me if I'm wrong there, John, but 1964, I believe was the first time yep. they got together yep. and it's been developed ever since. And there's eight chapters of the fleet safety council across Ontario from the North to the East, to the Southwest and the West and to the, um, uh, uh, the very South and Toronto as well, the central. So those chapters again, are, are about prevention and it's about making sure that, uh, people can go home safe at night. And in our case, we do health and safety related training and consulting. Uh, we support labor and management, both our board is half and half labor and management and on all those three sectors, transportation, construction, and utilities. And similar to our labor management network, the fleet safety council, again, meets regularly in each of those chapters and looks to improve the awareness of, of prevention methods out there and things to mitigate injury and. In this case, we're driving, making sure that um, people understand what training is available to them. Also provide input on what that should be. Maybe change in legislation, change in regulations or Highway Traffic Act, things that can improve um, the outcomes of, of the transportation sector. Um, so John, you're, you're the co-chair of the Central. Thanks for chair. that. Appreciate I'm it. actually the chair. I'm oh, the big the chair. guy. You're I am the, the big okay. kahuna. Yes. The <laughs> I can <laughs> report it. Yeah. Actually, what it was, was there was a big lineup and, and it was like, does anybody want to be chair? And the other guy stood backwards, just took a step backwards and I wasn't paying attention. So yeah, I yep, got in really quick. And doing an awesome job. And, and Chris, you also participate in, in the various uh, committees. I think you're in the Hamilton you mentioned. So 
um, this is what it's all about. It's about getting yeah. volunteers into a group that you know, has the same mindset and want to do the, want to do good for the industry from a health and safety side and, and other activities to make more efficient the, uh, the whole industry, yeah. uh, more effective. And again, to, to look forward, not look behind so much, but to look forward and how to do things better. Uh, yeah. and that's what we're all about. So in a nutshell, I'll, I'll tell you, I think the, um, fleet safety council is the best bargain out there for safety people in, in transportation to get an education. I mean, I've listened to MTO officers come in. Um, John, who have you had recently come in and speak at the central? Oh gosh, we've had OPP have come in. Um, yeah. we've had, we've had IHSA actually come in. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marin Gamble was into both chapters, London and central to talk about the health and, uh, the health and safety excellence program. Right. So, so, I mean, where else can you get access to an awesome group of really good speakers plus mm -hmm. associate with other safety people who have similar interests as to you? And yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Cheap. It's cheap. It's, you know, usually oh, what, yeah. $50 for a membership or 75 yeah, yep. for a year. And if 50, 50 for a member, for, for an individual membership or a hundred dollars for a corporation. Right you know, on. Like you can't beat that. Like we used to be called the best kept secret. Um, and, and trust me, all, all the chapters have been trying their darndest to advertise, advertise, promote, promote, promote. Cause we don't want to be the best kept secret. We're trying to get Absolutely. everybody to know you just, here's where you want to be. You want to be in the know. Here's where you want to be. And it's what two hour meetings, three hour meetings, once a month, uh, for yep. about eight, eight or nine times a year. And yep. again, yep. it's a regular activity that doesn't take a lot of time um, no, and no. fantastic speakers. We had someone on tie downs for equipment, OP, a former right. OPP um, staff and uh, provided some excellent information to the Toronto yep. chapter. You had, uh, you had, I think some uh, vehicle manufacturers there talk about technology, yep. John, at yours yep. and yep. The, uh, central. So really keeps you in the loop as to what's going on in the transportation yep. sector. And we're very proud to, uh, to help support administratively the, uh, the fleet hmm. safety council and at the annual fleet safety council oh, conference. conference yes huge right. event huge fantastic event. every october end yep. of october and fantastic speakers great opportunity yep. to learn about the industry yep. and to keep in, in the loop of the industry and yep. the chapters all contribute and, and identify their activities for the year as well yep. so it's yep. a great opportunity to get the word out there and get more people involved oh well, you know and and, and, and and then take on into account the networking opportunities with all these people you get to interact with. So absolutely. I, I have a very self-serving question to ask. All right. Is training in the trucking industry is training required by any legislation? Oh, absolutely. So again, it depends on your circumstance. There's requirements for, um, whether it's the federal uh, regulations um, or the provincial regulations, you're an employer, right? So you have obligations under e in either of those or both in some cases, if you're provincial and federally uh, regulated to ensure that you've got super supervisions trained, um, certainly any risks that you are, your workers are exposed to. There's a requirement for training. It, it, these things weren't built yesterday. So these regulations and uh, weren't built yesterday. They were built on again, history of, of things that happen and whether it's fork truck training, whether it's the driver training themselves, whether it is, um, you know, working at heights, um, uh, working on a lift, uh, elevating your platform often, you know, to pick and, and get materials ready. Um, there's all kinds of training that's required out there and each company needs to understand what their obligations are and, and make sure that those are covered. I want to, I want to touch on a word you used and I want our audience to realize this particular word you used. And that word was, um, the employer has a requirement to train their workers. Nowhere did you say employee, subcontractor, owner, operator, anything along that line, it's workers. So it doesn't matter in how you pay that off that person. It's the fact that you, they're working for you. You have to train them. Yeah. And, and there's, I mean, there is that, that definition of employee and, and worker, um, you know, we kind of use them interchangeably, but again, if we're getting into the whole independent or driver ink kind of angle, uh, again, be careful on how you contract with them because you may have those obligations. 
at the very least, if they're in your facilities and they're doing work with your people, what, what is, what have you done to ensure that they are trained? If you didn't train them, that they have a record. Um, a great thing, if I can do a plug, can I do a plug? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Plug, plug. We love it's plugs. around, it's around the company having managing health and safety, including all those associated with driving, um, having a, having a plan and having a system that supports it. Most companies, I mean, all companies are going to have a financial system, right? Accounting systems. You're probably going to have a scheduling system, right? Something that helps you understand where your drivers are and all that. When we ask companies, do you have a health and safety management system? What do you do for health and safety? A lot of companies are like, well, I've got a look at this great book I've got. It's a nice binder, isn't it? And what we're saying is it, that's not going to be enough to cover you from a due diligence perspective. It needs to be active. It needs to be um, reviewed. It needs to be updated. It needs to continuously improve. And that is something like what we have um, is certificate of recognition or core for short. And that means that it's, you work towards a standard for health and safety uh, management system, our core standard, and then you implement it. You can work on it. And you mentioned the health, health and safety excellence program for WSIB earlier. Yep. That's a great opportunity to get some incentives back by the WSIB workplace safety insurance board sure. to start to work towards your health and safety management system that is alive and thriving, um, and active working toward core, if you want to go to that ultimate step of meeting the standard, that means that you've, you know, again, you can cover your due diligence, you identify all your risks. So when you mentioned about what do you have to do across, you know, the different regulations, well, that process will, will require you to identify all your hazards, identify the means of mitigation, identify the training that's required. So it's a systematic way of doing things. And we really encourage everybody, you don't have to go the full length of, of core but you can go to our website at ihsa.ca, look under the core standard and just use it. It's there. It's available to you. Take a look at it, assess where you're at as a company. If you wish to go to get certified all the way and get third-party audited, great. If not, just use it. We encourage everybody to use it. And it's a great well, thing to do because it's there for you. I, I, again, it's, it's don't sit here and, and, and crab and whine and moan about, oh, my premiums for WSIB and blah, blah, blah. When, hang on. The same people you're paying premiums to have an incentive program that they'll pay you back. Right. And it helps you build that system to make yep. it better for your, to retain your workers, make sure no one gets hurt. Uh, it'll improve, it'll improve so many other aspects. And it's hard for us to say which ones exactly, because it's sometimes it's, exactly. it's hard to get that evidence, but you're probably going to have better delivery, better quality and the whole nine yards uh, and your people will be engaged. Your workers will be yep. engaged. Yep. And that's a, that's a huge, huge benefit moving forward. Mm -hmm. And if awesome. I can throw one plug out there to IHSA, there is a heck, first of all, there's a lot of training that is available through your organization mm -hmm. and there's a lot of free training as well. I mean, there's Absolutely. some training that you, you got to pay for, uh, but there's an awful lot, at least, you know, there's a lot out there that is free and really high quality from IHSA. So. I would encourage you uh, listeners and viewers to check it out and see what it is that's available. And maybe that would encourage you to actually pay for some as well. Once you see the high quality stuff that they do yes, have available. Very well. Thanks for that, Chris. And, and the one thing I want to say is if you're paying through WSIB for your coverage, you're already a member of ours. You paid for our service. And that's why some oh, of those, wow. a, a big portion of those um, services and resources are free because You've prepaid, we like to say prepaid them through your WSIB remittances. Um, so go to the website, ihsa.ca. You've got all kinds of materials and resources you can use. Other subjects, mental health that are just coming up. We've got a whole great product line there or not product line, but, uh, resources available. Our road safety page. And yes. it's, it's, we're talking right now it's winter. We have five yep. videos, short learning videos that are in YouTube. Fantastic opportunity. They're about three minutes, four minutes each. And there, again, a series of five that will help your drivers uh, get into the mode of winter driving and the goods and bads of winter driving and how to do things to mitigate risk. So those are all free resources there. Yes, there are some fee-based resort or fee-based mm -hmm. activities as well, like training, some training, uh, but again, subsidized because you're already yeah. paying for it through your, through your WSIB. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. That's awesome.